Callisto Protocol will, in fact, scare the pants off of all of us. There will be no more pants. What is fear? Fear is such a basic part of who we are. Where is it created? Atmosphere in a game like this is everything. It's terrifying, but it's beautiful. And how can we use it? With horror, there's no rules. Glenn Schofield and the developers of the Callisto Protocol invite you to join them and some very special icons of horror. I think it goes back to the earliest times around a campfire. The perfect horror experience is something that, that scares the piss out of me. Think of it as a roller coaster. I want it to make me feel things. I want it to startle me. They're all magic tricks. Well, that's what we're doing in the movies. As they discuss crafting the perfect horror experience. <laughs> The five tenets of horror for the Callisto Protocol are brutality, atmosphere, tension, helplessness, and humanity. The Callisto Protocol is mastering horror. The tension in the game is key. Well, when you think about horror, you know, it's not just sort of an endless series of jump scares one after another. Tension is built in the moments where you know something is coming, but you don't quite know what it will be and where it will come from. And then that release, whether it's a scare or not, right? You have to be on your edge of your seat because you know you never know, uh, are, are we gonna scare you then? You know, players wanna have moments of success. Players wanna have moments where that tempo is changing. So that adds to the tension, it adds to the suspense, it adds to the unknown. It's about blowing air into the balloon, making it bigger and bigger. So when there's finally that moment of release, that burst of horror, the jump scare, we get as sort of big a reaction as possible from the player. That kind of tension building is uh, similar to film and TV. If you can, you know, work on the anticipation of the audience, if you can play their anticipation against them. That's another way to, to build suspense and to make things, you know, more terrifying. Most people want to avoid or get out of a feeling that's so intense and dreadful. In fact, our natural response when we feel an intense negative emotion is to find a way out of it, make it stop. Those of us who are willing to tolerate that peak are actually kind of more emotionally intelligent when we know eventually that's going to dip out. And those folks that interact with the game for prolonged periods of time are better able to be in control of emotions during that tension. So atmosphere in a game like this is uh, everything. Atmosphere and mood is very, very important to the success of, of horror, to, to building suspense and to set the stage for what's coming. It's so critical to kind of creating that experience, that sort of visceral sort of emotional reaction. Alien, the spaceship. You know, you're a gazillion miles from home, and if you believe what's going on, you're with them a gazillion miles at home. To me, that movie is one of the best examples of atmosphere. You're treated to a lot of cool visuals of the environment, and you know, you get to know this workaday world of these, you know, space truckers and, and what their spaceship looks like, et cetera. 
What does atmosphere mean? It means lighting. It means the space we're in. Is it wide open? Is it tight and claustrophobic? What are the sounds we're hearing? The atmosphere almost informs you of what can happen to you, what will happen to you, what is the overall attitude in the place that you're in. So when we think about sort of our environments, the mood, the atmosphere, it's all about building that tension. I think that what we're talking about is vulnerable people and a place where there is a great deal of jeopardy, which they may or may not know about. So what happened to the original colony? The big word for atmosphere, I think, is immersion. I want to feel getting spooked while looking over my shoulder. I want all of that. I love it all. I think that's the beauty of, of, of the whole gaming world, is that you are truly immersed and you sort of control your own destiny. And this one is, I mean, the guys that made it, I was like, are you OK, man? How did you think of that? And, and and what went through you, like, what was your creative process to think of that? That is unbelievably scary. The design of the prison and the overall planet and just the environment is a pretty, it's a pretty deep process. We probably put half of our resource just on environment design into getting the right atmosphere. starts with our concept team. You know, we'll throw kind of just a bunch of general ideas at them, like what does gem pop look like? What does solitary look like? What does the surface of Callisto look like? I think of design as like a pyramid where you lay down a big foundation of lots of different ideas where you try to be as disparate as possible with what you're showing so that the director can go, I don't like that, I don't like that, I don't, ooh, but I like that, I like that. And then that moves up to the next level, which is a which is a, you know, a smaller platform. And then you keep going, you keep going until you arrive at that thing at the top. In the beginning, it was mostly just the environment artists and the concept artists talking together. And we would go back and forth of, oh, this would look better. Or how about this? What about this color scheme? And those guys, they're so creative. You know, they find these great references and then they'll kind of take those references and just turn them into something you can't even believe. Instead of a mood where someone else that's like really good at architecture comes in and do some amazing designs and then we can like take that further, getting different moods, different pieces. It's it's a lot of back and forth between different concept artists and I get to learn a lot from from them as well. Certainly I think we did our fair share of research. So we have influences, uh, Cameron, we have uh, Kubrick, we have uh, Ridley Scott. Our art director, Demetrius, and I spent a lot of time like finding imagery and stuff that we would kind of throw their way. Like, hey, you know, we're thinking uh, we need some sort of a futurized uh, panopticon area inside the prison, or we need to, to futurize like what does solitary look like? Like, we want it to be darker. We want it to be more brutal feeling, just something that is just terrifying to walk through. We want to make you afraid of opening every door. You know, why are all the cells empty? You know, that sort of thing, right? We want you to, to think a little bit as well, right? When we were doing the research, uh, some of the stuff became self-evidence. When we were designing the creatures, uh, mutation was uh, something that we were putting forth. And then we were designing the environments to match that. We thought, oh, what matches mutation? Oh, uh, what's the technology that matches mutation? There's something called generative design that's for taking man-made objects, throwing it through AI, and it mutates it into a new design. But what comes out, looks very alien and not man-made at all. So it was a perfect match for what we were doing with the creatures. And so we'll go through a few revs of kind of like designing what the lighting scheme would be like, what the color scheme would be like. They didn't have a clue what was going on. Things are changing. To come up with a color palette, we actually go, went through mm -hmm. the uh, psychology of the color, uh, emotion of the colors as well as to actually referencing a lot of movie, horror movies, sci-fi horror movies. Yeah, the emotional color is an interesting thing. You know, I didn't really think about it before. And, you know, working with lighting and, and the team, they sort of introduced, like, you know, we watch these movies and they put colors into scenes that we don't really think about. One of our areas is a very kind of wet processing area. And so we deliberately use greens and yellows and browns in those because they are colors which emphasize disgust. 
And so we want the disgust to come through as the underlying fear element in those areas. And we play around with color space theory all the time through our very sophisticated lighting system. Combining that with us trying to tell the story of what's happening in each one of these spaces, using materials, using bloody handprints, following a trail to like someone who's lying there on the floor. Combining that with the color theory, it uh, you know it provides a very impactful experience. I think. Sim, our, our environment director, you know, he has guided our environment team in building these, these great spaces that not only are just beautifully horrific, but also really compelling and really fun play spaces that you can travel through and, and want to explore and want to, to understand by looking at your environment what happened here. There's a lot of different ways to go about it, right? High contrast, dark areas, gross spaces that you don't want to be in, right? Makes you uncomfortable and lots of blood. Each space should make you feel a certain type of way. So going along with, okay, how do we make the player feel isolated? Well, that's gonna be a totally different kind of feel. It's gonna be made out of different material. It's gonna sound different when you walk around it. Or how do we make the player feel trapped? That's gonna be another kind of environment. So it's going off of what we kind of know and then making it fit into kind of that world and how we wanna make the player kind of feel in that moment. Confusion is an important part of horror. And uh, providing information, maybe misinformation or taking away information or making information abstract. Uh, and we can ramp that up or uh, dial it back. I mean, if it was brightly lit, you feel safe. You know, you're like in a hospital, everything is white and sanitary. But in the darkened basement, you can't see even peripherally what might be coming up at you. One part of tension is what's around the corner. Uh, a lot of times we're designing very claustrophobic places in concept. We kind of are ca uh, casting shadows that could possibly look like some monster hiding around the corner. Glenn wanted to create different entryways for the monsters to come out. I think that's why it's really good that this is a third person thing. You know, you'd have a sense that there is a back and you can't see what's behind you or what's beyond the frame to the right or the left. It's not just gonna be, you know, one door opens and they're right there. It's coming out from different um, vents and pipes and uh, sometimes you hear something in the background and you don't notice it, but then you do as the audience member. In the 50s and 60s, there was a filmmaker by the name of William Castle, and he understood that enhancing shock and fear could be more fun. I love William Castle. I'm very attracted to those kinds of um, larger-than-life personalities, people who are, you know, they, they may be doing something cheesy and, you know, low art, but um, they're pushing the envelope there. He developed this thing called a Percepto buzzer. He would have these buzzers in seats go off while the movie was playing, probably during points of tension. This was essentially shocking moviegoers, but it was also very exciting for them. The new PlayStation controller is amazing, right? I mean, it's the, the combination of being able to feel your heartbeat and the, and the footsteps and everything around you. And so that puts it right in your lap, in your hands. And so we've been able to amplify everything the same way with the buzzers under the seats. We can buzz you. And on the flip side, on some of the kind of body gore stuff, we can feel a bone breaking when you lop it off and stuff. And it's that type of stuff that makes you kind of winch a little bit. It's, it's really satisfying. But then being able to have the speaker built into that controller as well, it kind of gives you a whole new tool in your toolbox. You know, like what it, you could be walking down a hallway and hear whispering and be like, well, where the heck's that coming from, right? And it just kind of trickles out of that speaker. You know, be able to kind of use that to build atmosphere and tension. It's like a kid in a candy store with stuff like that for, for a game like this.
using elements of sound in order to create fear is, I think, brilliant. You know, not just the sounds of the creatures, which are terrifying on their own right, but the sounds of the environment and the music and, and the part that that plays. Cameron told me that, that he felt that 40% of the visual impact of any given shot or image is sound. And that's a substantial proportion. Audio plays a huge role in this uh, in supporting what otherwise is just an empty hallway. And the ability to engineer horror is a lot easier in my opinion. You know, being able to walk down a hall and just hear something, even if you can't see it, hear something walking or hear something fall or hear something scratching and not knowing what's gonna happen. Those are the type of things that, that can send a, a shiver down your spine without having to see anything at all. I gotta say, Glenn spends an amazing amount of time focused on the audio. The music to me is 80% of the audio. You've got to have this music in which you're tense. Making people feel scared is kind of like what we're hired to do on this, right guys? We've done a lot of things with our apprehension engine. The apprehension engine is something that Hollywood has used. It's brand new. It's this crazy invention, right? It's a weird looking thing and it's got metal on it and strings and stuff. And the sounds it makes are just awful. There are only a handful of them built and it's got a variety of things that you can do with it. For me, the apprehension engine is, it's like a chaos playground. got sort of this core box and there's kind of a three string kind of cello component. The most basic thing is it's got a, a reverb spring in it. You can just flick it with your finger like this and make the loudest noise you have ever heard. It's so disturbing. It's in Dr. Sleep actually several times. It comes with a little bow and with that you know there's like these rulers that it has and each one is a different length so you can get different pitches and bend the rulers as if that wasn't enough. <laughs> then it's got a, basically a hurdy-gurdy built into it, and the hurdy-gurdy can be played either with a slide or you can play individual notes. I think I watched YouTube videos to figure out how to even put it together because the instruction manual is really minimal. And once you start playing it, you realize you're like, oh, well, it's, it's just gonna tell you what, you know, you're gonna just react with it and there's no like right way to play it. And I think it's, it made so much more sense after spending some time with it. It's like. Of course, yeah, it's just like whatever you, you know, put into it, it's gonna sort of give you that kind of like weird tension vibe energy back and it's just gonna create this kind of like feedback loop of hellscape sounds <laughs> that come out of it. I'm sure this has been done, but I feel like someone needs to do like a Hollywood Bowl show where it's just like one <laughs> individual up there and it's just, you know, act one is, you know, beautiful sounds. Cause you can get some interestingly beautiful sounds haunting. and rhythms out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Haunting. Um, but then act two would be, you know, everyone it's time to go home. Like let's get aggressive. Act two. <laughs> Every project you're trying to make it is, is fresh and unique and, and something people haven't heard before. And it, it makes it really, really challenging, but also incredibly fun too, because you know, it's great to, to do crazy things that people haven't maybe 
I haven't heard as much. And you get away with that like crazy in, in, in the horror genre. Having the creative freedom to be experimental, like no boundaries is so, it's so freeing on it, you know, especially with an instrument like this, like not many other projects would be cool with it. Knowing when to use those tools, I think it's key to sort of manipulating, you know, the, the audience. I mean, it is just amazing the amount of audio and the amount of layers and the amount that the player feels like this is a real world. I think if we're able to connect to the point that we can make our players jump in their seats, we are on a good path. It's terrifying, but it's beautiful what they created, this world. I mean, I love the sci-fi outer space aspect of it, you know, and then the, the intimacy of the prison and all the stuff that happens within that and how they designed all that. To me, they created this world that is awesome and, and also very scary. I want the quality of the content that we're delivering to be on par uh, with any film.